On April 11, 1970, NASA launched the Apollo 13 mission on a Saturn V rocket with the intention of making the third lunar landing. The mission was not remembered for its launch, but for the events that occurred on April 13th and after, which we covered in Today in Space History on April 13th. However, I want to take the opportunity of the launch to introduce the vehicles involved and the cast of characters in the drama. Or at least some of them, because to bring the crew of Apollo 13 back safely would take the combined efforts of a community of engineers and specialists. First, let's meet the crew. Jim Lovell was commander for the mission. He had flown on the 13-day Gemini 7 mission, then the final Gemini mission, Gemini 12, alongside Buzz Aldrin, and most recently on Apollo 8, which took the famous Earthrise photo, so a more experienced astronaut could, would have been hard to find. Then there was Fred Hayes, the lunar module pilot, who was on his first space flight and would go on to do space shuttle landing tests. And last was Jack Swigger, the backup command module pilot, who replaced Ken Mattingly, who had potentially been exposed to rubella, but not really, he didn't actually contract it. Anyway, let's proceed with the launch and we'll talk more about the mission on the way up. All 13 is go. T minus 20 seconds. T minus 20 seconds and counting. 17, guidance release. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Ignition sequence has started. 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. The Saturn V building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust and it has cleared the tower. I've condensed what ended up being a slightly longer than expected launch, so we'll pick up the audio at a key point later on. The first stage was the most intense part of the flight up. If it failed, the crew's only hope would be the launch escape system, the tower on the top of the Saturn V that would pull the command module away from the rest of the vehicle using solid rockets. While the first stage didn't fail during any Apollo mission, Apollo 12 was struck by lightning during this phase of the flight, about 36 seconds into the launch, which caused a power surge that knocked out instrumentation. The ECOM for the mission, the guy in charge of the electrical, environmental, and communication systems aboard the spacecraft, was John Aaron, and he quickly suggested that they try SCE to AUX, which allowed the system to function under low voltage, um, and that saved the mission. I mention that incident because John Aaron will also be instrumental in saving the lives of the Apollo 13 crew through more electrical workarounds and wizardry. It's also worth noting that on Apollo 12, Commander Pete Conrad could have chosen to pull the abort lever at that point, and may have done so if communication had also been knocked out. Um, it's worth noting also that Mission Control would have worried that actually the parachutes wouldn't have worked if he had done that, because they were concerned that the lightning strike could have disabled the explosive bolts that opened the parachute compartment, a concern they never relayed to the crew, since there was no chance of survival if the parachutes couldn't deploy anyway. It turns out they were able to, and the Apollo 12 crew survived. Uh, this gets to a key point, though. There were all sorts of malfunctions on the Apollo missions, and everyone understood that it was extremely dangerous. The goal was to ensure that no single malfunction would jeopardize the crew, but there were limits to how well that could be fulfilled, especially when it comes to parachutes. Anyway, here we are on first stage separation and second stage ignition. And we see skirt set there. You can see from this angle that there are five engines on the second stage, one on the inside and then four on the outside. They're J2 engines. Here we have the launch escape system being jettisoned, as it is no longer useful in this phase of flight. This is potentially the most dangerous part of the mission because should the second stage fail, uh, such that it needs to be shut down, the vehicle is not yet at the point where the remaining stages can carry it to orbit necessarily. At a certain point during the second stage burn, the crew gets a S4B to COI call, which indicates that they can abort to orbit using the third stage. Now, as it so happened on Apollo 13, the second stage did have an issue. And actually, all the second stages up to this point actually had an issue, but they didn't really fully realize the, the severity of it. Anyway, at around the time of the S4B to COI call, the center engine of the stage shut down two minutes early. Let's listen in starting at 5 minutes and 40 seconds after launch. 13 Houston, stand by for S4B to COI capability. S4B to COI, Roger. Roger, you've got it now, Jim. We've got S4B to COI. 
Uh, booster reports that the inboard engine uh, shutdown was a bit early. Uh, we're continuing to burn on the uh, four outboard engines. 13. Go ahead, sir. And uh, here's the, what's the story on engine five? Jim, uh, Houston, we don't have a story on why the inboard out was uh, early, but the uh, other engines are go and you're go. Roger. The story, as it turned out, was that there were pressure oscillations in the fuel lines and the turbo pump, resonating at a frequency of 16 hertz, 16 waves per second. When oscillations resonate, they amplify, and in this case, it was enough to warp the thrust frame by 3 inches. Engineers knew about these pogo oscillations and were already developing ways of fixing it, including adding helium to stabilize the fuel flow and reduce pressure variations. But clearly, those engineers did not expect the severity of the effect in this mission. As we see here, the second stage go out, the troublesome second stage being discarded in favor of the third stage, which has just one J2 engine. If the guidance system hadn't sensed fluctuations in the center engine's thrust chamber and shut it down, the crew would have been in even greater danger than they eventually will be once we get to April 13th. In later Apollo missions, the helium was added and the propellant valves were simplified and other measures were taken to alleviate the problem. The net result for Apollo 13 was that it took a little bit longer to get to orbit because they had to burn the second stage for longer and use a bit more of the third stage. Here we see the third stage shut down as they reached their intended orbit, their parking orbit, and it was retained because it would be relit for the translunar injection which would bring them to the moon. And so we'll see here in a moment, it's relit for that purpose. And here they are making their way to the moon. And this is only a couple of hours after the launch. This seems like a good time to introduce a couple more in our cast of characters except for the crew and John Aaron. First is Gene Kranz, the lead flight director who is in charge of mission control and critical in keeping up morale and focus. After the accident, he immediately brought in his mentor, uh, Chris Kraft here, NASA's first flight director, to help organize efforts, much of which had to happen outside of mission control. As with the entire Apollo program, however, success or failure ultimately depended on thousands of people I can't name, who got as little sleep as the crew between April 13th and April 17th, and who had to use what technology they had to bring the crew home safe despite a huge hole in part of their spacecraft. But through the translunar injection everything seemed to be going fine. Uh, the issues with the second stage completely forgotten at this point and they had no bearing on the accident that was to come. And so the, the mission uh, coasted along with one more important event to take place on April 11th which was the separation of the command module and then docking with the lunar module so that the command module could pull it away from the third stage and get get on its way to the moon. So we'll see that in a moment here. So here is what the mission looked like before this separation and we will see the fairings on the side of the lunar module separate and the command module move forward as it is decoupled from the top of the lunar module and then it has to flip around and dock up again. This gives us a chance to talk about the actual spacecraft uh, aside from the Saturn V that we've been uh, looking at for most of this. Uh, so the very top of what we see here, the furthest to your left, is the command module and the cylindrical tank it is attached to along with that engine is the service module. They are separate modules and the command module is essentially insulated from the service module thanks to the heat shield uh, but there are umbilicals that uh, connect it to the service module that provide power and um, other systems especially life support. And so here you see the command and service module collectively named Odyssey by the way. So the command and service module the CSM here is called Odyssey. The the lunar module that it is going to dock with is called Aquarius and so in the mission tapes you'll occasionally hear them talk about Aquarius and Odyssey and that's what they're referring to. Here we have a camera of the the docking taking place from Apollo 13 so there's Apollo 13 specific footage and you can see 
uh, both the simulation and footage sped up by four times. Uh, they were very careful about the docking and so was I because it's, it's a tricky business and you don't want to mess it up. So here uh, the command and service module is docking with the lunar module. The lunar module of course was what was going to land on the moon but it ended up being the lifeboat for this mission uh, because while the service module had its life support systems uh, eviscerated by the explosion, uh, the lunar module still had its life support systems and they would have to rely on that in order to survive. But the lunar module was only built for two people because two people go down to the lunar surface and of course it wasn't meant to have life support for six, seven days, it was only meant to have life support for uh, two, three days. So that is part of the rub and part of what all those people down on the ground are going to have to solve how to get the lunar module to help these guys survive for as long as they need to. But here we go, the command and service module pulling the lunar module out of the third stage and now this is the spacecraft that is going to head to the moon. Actually the third stage also heads to the moon. The third stage that they are leaving behind there uh, ends up uh, smashing into the lunar surface and uh, they actually, uh, the instruments from the previous Apollo missions were set to detect the seismic uh, shocks from the tank exploding on the surface of the moon. So that's just an interesting little tidbit. But here they go, leaving the vicinity of the Earth and heading towards the moon, having no idea the peril they were in, that they were in basically from launch, actually. Uh, the problem with the service module was there right from launch and uh, they could have done things uh, if they had known that there was a problem they could have done things to prevent it but as it was they had no idea completely unaware of what was going to happen in two days time here so uh, with that uh, we will see what happens in the video on April 13th which will cover Houston we've had a problem and what happens after Thank you for watching this presentation of Today in Space History for April 11th, the Apollo 13 launch. The non-Kerbal Space Program footage was courtesy of NASA, and special thanks to Frizank for the Apollo Saturn V rocket model that was used in this video.